We are top of the league. Say we are top of the league. Oh, I don't want to get too carried away. Welcome to the Late Night Latte here on Latte Firm. It has just gone nine o'clock in the UK here and what a weekend of Barclays we've had, hey? Manchester City going to Sellhurst, winning yesterday in the early kickoff. Arsenal, the late kickoff at Brighton and we won so convincingly. And today, the battle at Old Trafford, Liverpool dropping points, having been 1-0 up. How do you like those stats, eh, Liverpool fans? But that is the situation. The league table has changed and we are top of the league. A warm welcome to everybody watching across both YouTube and X. Uh, get involved in the socials, get involved in the chat. And of course, please do drop a like on the video. It's a massive help to the channel. It really helps raise the profile of the channel on the YouTube feeds. We will go straight to the chat. And Afsar was first in the house evening all. And I just love Manchester United and shamely wearing the Manchester United shirt. Yeah, we were all Manchester today. We willed them on and sadly they just couldn't hold on. But listen, points dropped are points dropped. I'm taking that every day of the week. Ari Marsden says, hello, FK and family. Top of the league, baby. That's right. We are top of the league and we're going to enjoy it. And listen, if you can't enjoy these moments, if you really want to be a misery guts and not celebrate until the last day of the season, I salute you. But you have to take the, you've got to ride the waves. You've got to take the rough with the smooth and you've got to enjoy these moments. Uh, greetings to you, Ari. Uh, Uncle Doris, evening all a glorious day to be a gooner after United's improbably draw two miles away from home. It was a, it was a great game. A great game. And by great game, I mean life shortening and not very fun. Uh, I'm, I'll be honest with you, when May you netted, I must have been at the front doors of heaven. It was absolute scenes in my living room. Uh, v Vlad says, good evening, FK, and everyone. Good weekend for us. Win all seven and it's ours. Can we do it? So tantalizing. Uh, Joel Cooper. Hey, guys, looking forward to the show. Thank you very much, Joel. Nice to hear from you. Trevor Bibbins is in the house. Good evening, FK, the panel. We can do it, he says. Seven to go with the prayer emoji. Uh, Greg Horn says, cheers from Philly Latte Firm. Greg, it's great to have you in the house. And he's gone first. On the snack check, buffalo chicken wings with an ice cold beer, chilling at the top of the league. Keep the chat coming. Uh, there's already hundreds of you watching across all platforms, which I'm immensely grateful for. Get involved in the chat and let's bring in our panelists. First up, needs no introduction. It's Pedro from La Grove. How are you, buddy? Wonderful. What a, be what a beautiful weekend. What a beautiful weekend. I absolutely cooked myself with that uh my man united prediction and I, i'm i'm reveling in it what a what a great day didn't expect it at all i can't believe that the league title was in our hands how long have we waited for this it's unbelievable i do you know what it is unbelievable it's such a good feeling and listen ped you know you heard me say at the start of the show there are some fans that are like oh you know don't get too carried away and don't don't sort of enjoy it you've got to enjoy the moment right one 100 and uh i wrote this on la grove today I'm like listen First, uh, my my gr my youth has been George Graham. We won a lot of cups. Then it sort of cycled over to Arsene Wenger, and it was beautiful football. The expectation that we would always be competing, and then I never expected that the dark years would come, and they came, and they were very dark. And I don't care about the FA Cups. We weren't competitive in the Champions League. You knew we'd never win the league. Now we are competitive. I am going to enjoy every minute that we're top of the table, every minute we're in with a shout of any competition because you never know when it's not going to be there. You never know when you're going to be a Chelsea fan or a Man United fan. We're back at the top. We've got a team that's built for the next eight years. I'm really excited. And those people, oh, don't celebrate until the end of the season. What's the point? What's the point in football if you have to wait until the conclusion to enjoy it? No, I'm enjoying it. I'm absolutely loving it right now. That's right. Enjoy the ride while it lasts. Uh, let's bring in our other panellist. I can see him smiling from ear to ear in the in, in the sort of green room as you were. Rory, welcome. How are you? Thank you for having me on. Yeah, I'm very well, thank you. It's uh, The weekend couldn't have gone much better, so just enjoying the Sunday evening. Ah, oh, well, it, it's a pleasure to have you on. I know you've done your stream earlier. If anybody's uh, unfamiliar if unfamiliar with Rory, of course, Rory underscore talks underscore football on X, Rory talks football on YouTube. Uh, you've just done your stream. Um, are you doing another one maybe tonight or is, is that nah, you're done for the day? Done for the day. Done for the day. But we'll be back good tomorrow night for another. Good, good. Um, Emmanuel's in the chat who says, evening, guys. Can't believe United actually had a result for us. Come on, you gunners. Listen. We said it in the uh, late night latte in the week, the preview show for the Brighton game that, you know, United fans, United, the club, the players, all the staff, they would have wanted to have got something off Liverpool today. They know that it's Jurgen Klopp's last time at Old Trafford as, as Liverpool manager. They know that this fairy tale is there for him, the fairy tale ending. They would have wanted to do that. And so I was kind of hoping for a point dropped. And of course, it has happened. TJ, glory, glory, Man United. Let's not get too carried away, but I know what you're saying. Uh, Etienne Smith says, good evening all. Atwa in the house saying the head is shining. Thank you, my friend. 
It's not even freshly buffed. I don't know what's going on. I might go for a fresh trim tomorrow. Uh, right, chaps, let's talk about all sorts of things. Arsenal winning away down at the seaside, beating Brighton by three goals to nil. I think it's a marker that we've laid down. I think it's a great performance. Lots to analyse there. I want to eulogise particularly about Kai Havertz because he's really come into a rich vein of form and he's just shutting everyone up. Left, right and centre. Arsenal fans, non-Arsenal fans. Really got the bit, bit between his teeth. And Leo Trossard, um, someone who I'd have been open to offers for just a few months ago. This guy is coming off the bench and coming up clutch and delivering in key moments. I want to talk about that. We will, of course, look at the title race. We'll look at what happened today. We'll have a look at the league table with the jingle because uh, I think it's worth doing. Uh, so let's get straight into the content and a warm welcome to everybody watching. As I bring up the slides, Ped, let's start with you first. Um, thoughts or you know, feeling going into the game against Brighton uh, yesterday, which of course we we won and handsomely, the headline reading there, Gunners batter Brighton. Were you confident going into the game? Uh, you're on mute, my friend. I was confident that we wouldn't lose, but I don't think I was confident that we would take the three points. I thought this one had a, a score draw written all over it. Really? Um, I, yeah, I, I, really? I, I, though okay. I, I was quite disappointed with them against Liverpool in the second half last week. So um, I thought if we showed up um, um, and put on a performance that we'd get something out of it. But yeah, I wasn't 100%. I thought that was the, the second hardest game that we'd have to deal with um, for the rest of the season. So I was to see us show up, absolutely dominate and uh, put them in a bit of a headlock was uh, was was good. Wow. Well, to the contrary, I mean, I felt really confident going into the game. Rory, I don't know what side of the fence you were on. I mean, I said in the preview show, Brighton, they've been dysfunctional recently. They've got injuries to, to one or two key players. And I know they've only lost once at home this season in the league since August, which which actually threw me <laughs> during the game when the commentator mentioned that. But I was quite confident of getting three points. I mean, I think we've outperformed what I thought. I mean, it was emphatic in the end. But how are you feeling, Rory? Yeah, I was confident. Uh, didn't want to come across cocky, but it did feel like it could have been a banana skin. I could understand why people thought it was a potential banana skin, but the way Brighton have been recently, they've, they've still got a lot of injuries. The way we've been playing, I thought we had a relatively easy midweek game against Luton, whereas they went to Brentford and had a bit of a, a tough game. So it felt like, you know, we it would have to be our own downfall not to go and get the win. And, you know, recently we've just not been, not been creating our own downfall. I know. Uh, Henke Ho's in the chat. He says, we are here. It's cold on top. Ice in our fogging veins. Uh, bring the snack check, you beautiful bull genius FK. The snack check for me tonight, chaps and ladies and gents watching around the world, is a strong brew because I've been fasting. We are approaching the, the end of Ramadan, which I'm immensely looking forward to. So I'm just hydrating. And I've got some... I've actually nicked my daughter's uh, Oreo originals. So I'm going to tuck into an Oreo. I don't think I've ever dunked an Oreo into a cup of tea. It doesn't doesn't seem like a very dunkable biscuit. Um, Rory, you got any sweet treats? Or Pedro, you got anything lying around on the desk today? Yeah, I've got a uh, caramel egg. Oh, an just... egg? Yeah, no, Ooh, caramel egg. A whole egg? I'm sure it's an entire egg, yeah. Might not Is that a tribute to that, Eric but... Ten Hag for getting a point today? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. So... I love that. What is it? Uh, just a normal, regular chocolate egg or is it a caramel egg? What? Uh, I think it's, car it's caramel milk, I think. So it's just oh we'll find gosh. out. Yeah, look, it's... Uh... Look at that. Oh, man. Wow, you have outdone yourself, Rory. That is, a, that is yeah. an extraordinary snack check. Uh, Pedro, what you got tonight? I've got nothing, but I used to work on uh, the advertising account for Oreo, and the Americans you? in your chat are going to be furious when they hear that you've said that you don't think the original dunkable biscuit is not dunkable. Hang on it's a second. Most this... dunk it's the most dunkable biscuit in America. That's, no. That's the, they, right. kids, the kids grow up doing that. Right. There's a, there's a, you know, millions of people talk about dunking it. So you need to go and get a glass of milk and you need to dunk it in the milk. That's the way Americans milk. Milk. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, I will do that for the next snack check, but I'm going to dunk it in tea just to kind of see how it holds up. So let's, let's have a go, ladies and gents, boys and girls. One second. Oh, yeah. 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 Mm. Did it work? I, th I think, mm. I think it's more of a milk vibe. Does it make the milk go chocolate here as well? Oh, I don't, I don't, is, I don't even know what, what I said there, but yeah, I'm looking forward to that. Right. <laughs> Let's get back to the chat. Keep your snack check coming. But um, I think, Rory, you just finished sort of explaining what your thoughts were before the game. When the lineup was announced, chaps, David Ryer in goal, Ben White, Saliba, Gabriel, Sinchenko in at left back, 
I really thought Ben uh, Mikel Arteta was going to ring the changes. He made a couple, but I thought he was going to maybe rest Ben White and play Tommy Asu. I thought maybe Kivio would be brought back into left back. I expected him to play Jorginho in midfield, who played alongside Rice and Erdegaard. And I thought Havertz may be given a breather, and I'm glad he wasn't because he was outstanding. Uh, and he played alongside Saka and Jesus. Uh, Ped, when the team news was was released, how are you feeling? I love the lineup. Yeah, I thought I thought it was great. I thought it was bold. I thought it was exactly what was needed. I was looking for Jesus to have a good game. I feel like he's really struggled for to, for form since he's come back. And he's been getting quite a lot of criticism. I mean, it w- definitely wasn't on my bingo card at the start of the season that Arsenal fans will be talking about losing Jesus in the summer, that he'd be like some sort of sacrificial lamb to our, our future transfer fund. Um, so it was good to see him get some minutes. He definitely offers something different to what Martinelli has. Um, and it was great to see Jorginho is now kind of like the, the number one person on the team sheet next to Declan Rice in midfield. So, um, you know, quite the turnaround for him from a PR perspective. Now, this 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 game really kind of summed up um, the wildness of last January and how everybody had a, a meltdown because we signed two very unfashionable players with one thing in common. They knew how to play in the Premier League. And I just look at Mudrick sitting on the bench, not getting excited uh, when Chelsea scored. And I'm like, that could have been us. We were begging for it. We were begging for Mudrick. And people didn't want to hear about Jorginho and Trossard. And these guys are absolute different makers, uh, difference makers uh, heading into the, you know, the the, the final throws of the Premier League. So, yeah, good start in 11. I liked it. You're on mute, okay. (laughs) They really are, said Pedro. You're absolutely spot on about Jorginho and Trossard making a real impact on this team. Uh, A couple of quick uh, comments that have stuck out. Um, Mika Carlson says, first time watching live. Cheers from Finland. Thank you so much. Uh, Pedro, you're getting some love. Donald says, Pedro is one of my favourite guests on both Latte Firm and the Highbury squad. Uh, HR87 says, Pedro in the house, elite guest. And Colleen, watching from South America, says, seven finals left. I'm loving this Arsenal shirt. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, it's the retro uh, Arsenal I've got a question for you two. Um, no, it's not my podcast that we're on, but hey, we can break the rules occasionally. Of course. Uh, Zinchenko's inclusion in this game and... Um, I spoke to somebody and they thought the inclusion is Arteta trying to get his minutes up to get him in form for the run-in, not stepping in for Kivior. Who is who is number one left back now? Is it Zinchenko or Kivior? I'm gonna yes, throw first. it out there. Over it, Rory. I'm gonna throw it out there and say it's neither of them and it's Tommy Asu. I think for me, I think the reasons I think Zinchenko starting means he's not going to start against Bayern. I don't think he's going to start three games in seven days when he's just come back from an injury. So then you go, so who's going to start against Bayern? Because that really is your first choice left back. And he's brought Tommy Asu on in both of the last games ahead of Kivio. So to me, that suggests that Tommy Asu is going to be the guy. But I love the fact that we've got all three. And I genuinely wouldn't complain about seeing either of them or any of them on the team sheet most weeks. So. I don't think Mikel has shown that he's um, got sentimental attachment to players too much, Ped. So I'm secretly hoping that he doesn't like lose his mind under the pressure of the run-in and just go for what he knows, which is Sinchenko and Jesus more than anybody else in the squad. I think Sinchenko does get a tough gig, though, because I think the instructions from the coach are tuck into midfield, invert, you know, he knows also that he's not the best defensively, you know, 1v1, whereas Tommy has to excels in that area. And I think that's why there's always gaps in behind Zinni. And I don't think there's much that Zinni can do about that. You know, he can't invert and cover the space behind and win 100% of his duels, as, as Mikel Arteta would love. But I think for different levels of opposition, like the Luton game was perfect. I was surprised he played last night. But of course, now with the benefit of hindsight, absolutely fine. If it's Bayern Munich on Tuesday or if it's going to Old Trafford or if it's if it's Spurs, I hate to say, you've got to go Tomiyasu. How about you, Ped? What's your thoughts on that? I, I love the, the the everybody that I speak to thinks that Tomiyasu's coming in. I think for the Champions League, Tomiyasu makes a lot of sense. But I, I am getting the feeling for the run-in that Mikel Arteta isn't listening to any of the slander in the fan base and that he thinks Zinchenko is absolutely key, whether it's bravery, technical ability you know like I, I, he seems to love Zinchenko and it doesn't seem like he's going to move off of him and now he's got him fit I think that maybe we'll see him in the Premier League next week but Tommy Asu is a good shout for uh for the Champions League game yeah I think so uh, Bailey Wilson in the house says 12 wins and we do the double 12 wins 
<laughs> oh my People god! People losing their mind. I love it. Could you imagine? Ask Avengers says, "Been an okayish weekend, hasn't it?" <laughs> and trash the raccoon. What a username! Says, "Just in time for the firm with a smiley face." Thank you so much. Right, there are just shy of a thousand of you watching live right now. I am immensely grateful for that. Let's move through the slide deck and talk about the game itself. So, courtesy of Premier League.com, here is the scoreline and Opta analyst with all the stats. Rory. A comprehensive win in the end. We obviously won by three goals to nil. We limited Brighton to an XG of 0.53. We had an XG in excess of three, not for the first time or the fifth time or the tenth time this season, but for you know many a time this year. 20 shots on goal for Arsenal against Brighton compared to their 10. Seven on target for us, two for them. But possession, a rarity. Less possession than the opposition. What did you make of the stats? Yeah, I mean, it's we've just become accustomed to conceding very few chances now. It's um, I think when you listen to rival fans, they're at the point of talking about it now where they're like, this is it's crazy to watch because you don't even get the enjoyment of thinking Arsenal might concede. Um, and I don't want I don't want to become too used to it, but but it's amazing to see. Um, and the possession stats really interesting because I think I think it shows that we can play slightly differently and I think that was a deliberate tweak to allow Brighton onto us a bit I think that's part of the reason Zinchenko played because he can play out of the press so easily um, and we let them onto us uh, and then we beat them in the transitions and Rob Edwards said after the Luton game that Arsenal the reason he thinks Arsenal are so you know up there at the top of the table is because we can play in so many different ways and this was again this was a different way to what we normally see um, and it worked out well and, and in the end yeah I mean look you know, I was confident we'd win, but I didn't really expect it just to be that comfortable. I love your point about the possession thing. You know, I've come on, obviously, the channel and done the weekly sort of uh, late night lattes looking back at games with stats. And we are often comfortably dominant when it comes to ball possession, 60, 70, even as high as sort of 75 percent, you know, in one or two games. So this is a real surprise. And I think I, I like your point about the fact that actually Mikel, as Rob said in midweek after the, the win over Luton, that, you know, Arsenal can guise themselves in different playing styles and different sort of scenarios. And I'm really impressed by that. Uh, Ped, we started off really well. Like, you know, in the first 15, 20 minutes, we were unlucky not to be sort of two or three nil up. And, you know, there was a chance from Gabriel, that bullet header, which hit the stanchion. Uh, Bukayo Saka was played through and curled it wide. Gabriel Jesus with a, a lovely shot from just outside the box, which was piled away for a corner. But it was a penalty that had to sort of help us, you know, break the deadlock. What did you make of the challenge from Lamptey on Jesus? And, and of course, Bukayo hitting the spot as always. Felt like Lamptey was having quite a bad game. He 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 didn't know he didn't know what was going on. Like he he was all over the place. His head was gone. I it was a nailed on penalty for me. I, I I was watching it on NBC. I just couldn't believe the fuss the commentators were creating about the penalty. I was like, that, how how are we even debating that? Some of the penalties that get given um, in other games get less debate that are far more um, have far more drama drama attached to them. So yeah. It was a nailed-on penalty for me, and the the penalty was there were quite a few interesting moments in that first half in general. It's like um, if Bukayo Saka misses that penalty, then you put doubt into the system just before half time, and it's a lot harder. Then you've got David Raya making that unbelievable save, Porto a Porto esque strike, um, and he somehow manages to keep it out. You know, you lose that goal just before half time. The second half is 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 monstrous because the home fans get behind the team, and the, there's a, there's a lot more emotion in the stadium. But um, we managed that first half um, incredibly well, and I do think one of the benefits that we we don't pay attention to in the back end of the season is everybody has to play three games a week. So I, I, when when Champions League teams play three time, three times a week, they're used to it. Brighton can't handle it. They don't have a big enough squad. Aston Villa, probably not going to be able to handle it over the next couple of weeks. So I think that they started to fatigue a little bit in the second half. I mean, I felt like the Brighton were gassed in the first half after, um, you, you know, chasing around shadows. But uh, yeah, we, we made it count. And that, that Bukayo Saka was, uh, penalty was really important. It really was. And listen, you mentioned the point about half time and how if we don't score that, the nerves, you know, and Cisco forced a great save from David Raya, Rory, just before halftime with that long-range shot, reminiscent to the shot that we faced against Porto when we were away in that first leg in the Champions League. But this time, Raya shuffles his feet very quickly, palms it away for a corner, and he got a standing ovation from the Arsenal fans. I mean, he didn't have much to do, David Raya, and we will talk about the clean sheets uh, at the end of the show, but 
you know, a really solid performance, concentration levels really high. That's not a dig at Ramsdale, but, you know, it just shows that when you're so dominant and you're not doing much, you've got to be on your toes. And he was, and he responded to that. And of course, he went in at halftime 1-0 up. Yeah, uh, I spent many years playing in goal and the, the extra step he takes before he makes that save to make sure that he gets there is really difficult because you almost have to like consciously tell yourself to take the extra step because you want to start the dive as quickly as possible as soon as you see where it's going. So it was a really, really good save. And, uh, you know, I just think he's improving. I think I think he's always been that level of goalkeeper, but there was definitely a an adjustment period when he came to Arsenal, a confidence, um, you know, an, an issue with confidence. But what we're seeing now is, as much as look, I love Ramsdale, I know every Arsenal fan loves Ramsdale, it, it is clear, I think, that that he has raised the level um, in pretty much every respect back there now. So, and I'm really happy for him and happy for Arteta because it's just another example of Arteta, you know, making a, a decision that he got a lot of criticism for and being proven correct with time. Indeed. And listen, that goal goes in. Halftime team talk completely changes. Mood in the ground completely changes. And of course, mood amongst the Arsenal fans and players maybe completely changes. Uh, Josh Stanton and Pablo Breezy got a couple of questions. I will save them until the appropriate section. Kish V says, I've got my iced latte twirl ready. I think you tweeted me. He says, hashtag snag check. I think you tweeted me with a picture of a twirl, an iced latte version. I'm, I'm most intrigued. I'm going to have to give it a go. Donald says, snag check for me is gin. Chin chin, absolutely. Uh, I've just brought up the attacking threat chart courtesy of Opt Analyst, and you can see Arsenal again, sort of dominant. Brighton having their moments, the little red mountain just before half time was that in Cisco effort. We came out in the second half, Ped, and I think it was important just to keep knocking on that door. The team talk would have been one of, you know, encouragement, would have been one of just keep it, keep, keep doing what you're doing, and just, you know, your, your time will come, your opportunities will come and take them. And Kai Havertz delivering again. But what I want to talk about before we talk about Havertz is. Saka was on the floor, and who popped up on that right-hand side? Cutting the ball across the box, it was Jorginho. Ped, at 2-0, talk me through the goal and, and, and I guess the lift that that must have had in your sort of confidence and mood for the afternoon. Just that everything about it was uh, pure new Arsenal. Uh, Jorginho stepping into a much more attacking role. And weirdly, when he, when he sort of bounded into the box... I was like, I couldn't think of anyone I'd prefer to be picking out somebody in the box right now. You know, we were getting into the box. We weren't always finding our man. And Jorginho taking on that responsibility was just electric. Martin Erdegaard with the unbelievable spatial awareness. It's like he's got radar. Like, he, I, I don't even know how he noticed that Jorginho was making that run, but he did. Uh, and, the, and the weight of the pass was absolutely perfect. And then Kai Havertz, he's starting to get a little bit of that, um, that Freddie Lundberg vibe remember in o2 where he just started to work out how he could time his runs to perfection the connection with uh uh dennis burkett was 2002 was it he was at a... uh, yeah i think it was i think it was that i think it was that league run but he's he's um he's he's got his he's got his striker's boots on i think there, there was a lot of hope what we don't want the chelsea kai harvards we want the Bayer leverkusen one and i know he played in a slightly different position but he was scoring a goal every other game and I don't know whether he'll get there, but the fact that he's, you know, got more goals than he's ever got um, in England uh, under Arteta, and it's so early into his Arsenal career, and he's still really a baby. He's only 24 years old. I mean, there's a lot left to go, um, but I'm, I'm really happy for him um, getting that goal. And maybe we can stop fretting over signing players from Chelsea now. William was the last one. We've got Jorginho. That's a massive win for us. We've got Kai Havertz. Uh, maybe we're picking the best ones now. So really happy for him. And I'm glad that nobody is saying this is the player that's going to down the Arteta project anymore. How wrong were those people that were making the most noise at the start of the season? Tell me about it. Look, I, I, I'm going to forward to the Kai Havertz talk. You know, Rory, I want to get your thoughts on Kai as well. I love this picture, by the way. I mean, this is art. Look at it. Look at the, just look at the faces of the Brighton boys. Like, just dunk staring at his teammate. Like, what can I do? The goalkeeper just, you know, lying on his ass and <laughs> Estupinian. Like, just, I, I love it. I, in fact, I mean, I love it. So I'm going to get this blown up. I love it so much. Um, Rory, 60 million down the drain is obviously the, the chorus, uh, is the line within the, the chant that we've got for Kai. Did you expect him to come as good as he has since February? I think he's got the most goal contributions in the Premier League, goals and assists. I mean, I, I didn't see it. Like, I, I was always pro Havertz signing because I thought Arteta could do something with him. I questioned what his best position was. And I've been saying on this channel that I really want to love Kai, 
but I don't quite know what Arteta wants to do because I, I don't think the number eight role was working. And of course, it takes time for someone to settle in. But now he's got the bit between his teeth, you know, Pedro saying shades of Freddy. A few people in the Twitter chat yesterday, so, you know, shades of RVP in terms of his movement and link up play. But he, he has his own identity and he's really coming good. Yeah, I mean, I uh, I love him, and I didn't, I, I, you know, I thought that he'd be better than the Chelsea Kai Havertz, right? Because he had to be, anyone had to be. But I didn't think that by April, you know, he'd be one of the first names on the team sheet. I didn't think that you'd be looking at going, well, I, I guess we could play Jesus off the left, maybe. You know, how do you fit Jesus in? Because Kai Havertz is going to be the guy that's playing through the middle. And, you know, he's come on leaps and bounds. You can tell he's playing with so much more confidence. Um, there was one point yesterday I actually loved, which was nothing to do with the attack. But he ended up, he chased all the way back to a point where he was basically at centre back. And I thought, you know, this is a guy that is just loving playing football and is really invested in Arteta and the squad. And then obviously you're seeing the numbers, you know, clocking up. Uh, the movement for his goal, the way he kind of feigns to go to the front post and then drops behind him uh, and taps it in. Like, Jesus could have done that against City. There was a big opportunity for Jesus to do that against City and he didn't. And it's those fine margins that are they're going to be big for us. They will indeed. Uh, Patrick says, evening all bit late today. Hope I didn't miss anything. Uh, Lou Weed in the house. Hello, peeps. And there's a, there's a lot of first-time viewers tonight. I'm really, really chuffed. Thank you so much, guys, for taking the time out of your Sunday evenings or mornings and afternoons, depending on where you are in the world. And for tuning in to Latte Firm, really appreciate it. If you'd be kind enough to give us a like on the video, that would be a massive help to the channel. Um, Pedro, we ended up going and getting a third. And this time, it was the former Seagull himself, Leo Trossard. And to quote him, are you not entertained, was his tweet afterwards. Now, we'll talk about the image on the right-hand side in just a second. But let's talk about Leo Trossard's goal first before we talk about his role in the team and the squad. Um, what a goal. I mean, Havertz gets the ball deep inside our own half, little through ball. Trossard has got to run a long way and his little legs just <laughs> running, 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 closes down on the goalkeeper, sits the goalkeeper down, dinks it over him and then gets to celebrate ice cold in front of the Arsenal faithful. Um, a fantastic goal. And it would have meant a lot to him because, you know, we did the breakdown on Latte Firm with Charlie Haffenden, who's a Brighton journalist. And he talked about how Leo Trossard fell out with the management towards the end of his days at Brighton. He was booed every time he, he got the ball on the pitch yesterday. But what a goal. And tell us, Pedro, about um, his role in the squad, the team, and, and what value he's bringing to Arsenal. I don't know why the Brighton fans booed him. Don't <laughs> boo a player when you know exactly what he's capable of. Um, he's a really interesting player for me. I don't always think he's best when he when he starts games. Sometimes, you know, sometimes he takes too many touches. Sometimes he can slow down the play. But I think when he's in the mood and there's a bit of a constraint on what he needs to do, um, he can be devastating. He really suited um, He really suited the game and he showed, you know, showed why teams fear us so much. Um, we caught them in transition. Um, and then when he was through on goal, you know, I remember back in the day, like Theo Walcott would break through and you'd be like, this is like maybe 30% chance this is going in. Did any Arsenal fan doubt where that ball was going to end up? Like I don't, I, I, and that's how confident I am. I think he's one of the best finishers um, at the club. His impact uh, this season has almost been like Andre Arshavan, like when he first arrived at the club. Um, pops up when he's needed to. Um, he's got devastating um, finishing. Uh, he can offer up assists as well. He's got pace. He's got some of that Santi Cazorla movement. Um, he's a really exciting special player. He he does feel like the the sort of squad player you get when you're challenging for the Premier League. You know, he he would have been a starter in the banter years, no doubt. But I don't think I would sell him in the summer. Having somebody that can score goals, that chip on the shoulder as well. You know, he's a late bloomer. Um, he's been at Brighton. Um, you know, he was in Belgium before that. Oh, was he at Belgium? I think he was in Belgium. Uh, I, I think those players are sometimes the good ones to pick up. You know, look at the hunger of Mudrick. He's sitting on the bench. He's getting 120 grand a week. He's young. He's set for life because he's got a 55-year contract. Trossard needed to make it uh, at Arsenal. He fought really hard for it, sat in the shadows. And now he's at Arsenal and he's showing the whole world how good he is. And I just think that having players like that in the squad is really beneficial. And I, I hope we don't sell him in the summer. I'm going to come to you, Rory, for your opinion on, on, on Leo. I, I would agree with uh, one of the key points that what you said, Pedro, in terms of his role. I can't see Leo Trossard as a starter, but I think as a finisher to a game, 
out of someone on the bench who comes on time and time again and time and time again and just comes up clutch with either an assist or a goal or he changes the direction of the game, the tempo. He, rem- he is the best finisher at the club, I think, actually. Ped, you know, I would agree with that. I think he's got a great finish on him. He reminds me a lot of Sami Nasri. I don't know why, but just, so I don't know if it's the fact that he's small or the way that he, you know, he took that goal. Well, who was it against at the Emirates where he sat down the defender and sort of bulleted it in? Was it Brentford? I want to say Brentford, but it might, might not have been. But he's a good player. And I've got to address this because Pablo has taken the, the, the time to kindly ask this. FK man. Your thoughts at times can be outlandish. How would you be open for offers to Leo Trossard? A very versatile squad option. Look, I get battered for that every day on socials. When I was doing a post-match phone-in ooh, six, eight months ago, it feels like, um, we were talking about raising funds. Actually, no, it was towards the end of last season. We were talking about raising funds in the summer, trying to go big. There was talk about Rice. There was talk about Caicedo. There was talk about one or two others. And I thought, right, who are the sellable assets in the team? You know, could we break even on Jorginho? Could we maybe break even on Trossard? Could there be one or two other youngsters that we'd sell? I asked the question, and obviously that's just stuck with me as an opinion. I do want to confirm, though, and just reiterate that I value him as a player. I think he's a good player. I don't think he's a starter. I don't actually know what his best position is, but I think Mikel, almost that uncertainty and that versatility plays into our hands, like we can play him in any game state scenario, and he always has an impact. Rory, what's your thoughts on the young Belgian? Young Belgian? What is he, 27, 28? Let's not start that. Yeah. <laughs> um, Rory, what are your thoughts? Yeah, no, I, I yeah, I love him. Um, I agree. I don't think he's a starter in our best starting lineup. I, the thing is, I think I think he's best off the left. I don't think he's got the raw pace to be a left winger in our squad. And I think if he starts a game against a fresh right back, he can struggle a bit. But when he comes on against tired legs, he's so quick with the ball. Um, you know, he's pretty much as quick running with the ball as without it. And uh, and he becomes quite a terror for them. So, and like you said, his finishing is unbelievable. He can come in through the middle off the left as the left eight if he needs to. So he's versatile. And uh, yeah, it's just, it's just good to have another relatively mature compared to the rest of the squad head that could come in in a game like that yesterday. And like you said, when he was running through, none of us doubted it. In fact, I think about, about five minutes before he scored, uh, I was doing a watch along and someone in my chat said, this is the sort of game state that Trossard scores in. And lo and behold, five minutes later, he did. So I do think, look, it's fine to have a specialist that can come off the bench um, and, and really is, you know, a bench player, but one that you would expect to come off the bench pretty much every game if they're there. I, I completely agree with you. Uh, Ian Lackin says, we need the sandwich back, FK. Yeah, the, the biscuits and tea are great, but me having a full-on chicken roast sandwich uh, with a gravy layer in the in the middle is a sight to behold 21k says you haven't seen kai yet Mikel is going to stick him at the tip of the diamond midfield next season gosh his ceiling i wonder uh dwayne salmon uh, says evening all dwayne you're very welcome dobbo's in the chat as well he was just saying a few moments ago that we've got uh seven finals to go it's our year vamos i can imagine dobbo shouting that in his in his living room the reason for the picture on the right hand side i know it's attribute, attributed to, to gabriel this moment because there was a moment late on with 3 nil up, and Gabriel makes a block with what looked like his bollocks. And he celebrates it as if it was a goal, and the Sky camera has caught this moment. But what was interesting was also Leo Trossard's reaction, because Trossard was also, like, you know, screaming. So it's not just a defender's thing. It's not just a defensive unit thing. This is a team thing, Pedro. What did you make of that moment? Like, when they showed the replay, I was, I mean, I couldn't help but sort of smile smugly, gleefully, and just be so proud of the boys. Sorry, FK, you bu- buzzed out there. Uh, sorry, the question there was, you know, what did you think of that moment when Gabrielle celebrated that block? Oh, my God, team, sorry, yeah. And the whole team swarmed to him, and, like, it was just a, a moment that was so wholesome for me watching on the sofa. Just reminded me of the, the 1998 sort of back five that we had, celebrating celebrating clean sheets, like they're celebrating goals. I just think it really captured... Um, captures the culture that they've got at the club that you know and those clean sheets aren't just for the defenders they're for everybody like everybody cherishes them um i think that arteta is just a master of motivating players and getting them fired up i think the partnerships that he's created in that um in that back line have been absolutely magnificent um and the thing that i love most about arteta that i didn't expect is that he would come with this like Diego Simeone, Jose Mourinho mindset when it came to defending. And really like the first couple of years at Arsenal were were, were focused mostly 
on defending. I remember people saying he doesn't know how to set up an attack. All he does is buy defenders. And now we're, you know, we're seeing the fruits of that. Gabriel and Saliba have been absolutely um, immense this season, but really not enough credit is given to everybody else for how they protect them. You know, we've had some good centre-backs over the years that have been completely exposed. I mean, remember Seb Squalacci. Do you remember him from Monaco? Yeah. I think he won the Champions League or he at least got to a Champions League final. And he he said, because he had a terrible time at Arsenal, he was like, you are so exposed as centre-backs at Arsenal. Not many people can make it. And that's not the case anymore because, you know, every, every single element of um, on and off the ball is considered. And Gabriel celebrating that at the end of the game, it just it gave me a real buzz because it, it shows how important every aspect of the game is to, to these players and how focused they are um, on delivering this title for us. You're quite right. Uh, De Guy says, Trossard, disrespect. These men don't know ball. That's obviously aimed at me. Uh, Rory, sorry for covering you temporarily. Quick question just on Gabriel. Um, I, I said on the post-match phone-in on Latte Phone, which we do on match days on Twitter. It's now available via Apple and Spotify. Nice little plug there. Uh, I said on the post-match phone-in that I, uh, I was asked, sorry, how good are Gabriel and Saliba as a partnership? Are they the best defensive pairing that I've ever seen at the club? And it was really difficult to think of a pair that was better. Uh, what are your thoughts, Rory? How good are these two? And if I had to push you to pick your favourite of the two, who would that be? Oh, God, that's uh, that's tricky. I mean, in terms of the, the best, def- it's the best defensive partnership I've seen because like my first real memory is when I could understand football, probably looking at Vermaelen at that point. Um, and I think I think these two are better than that. So... Look, I love watching both of them. I love watching the dynamic between the two of them. I love watching their friendship that has blossomed. And I love the pride that they take in keeping clean sheets. I love the pride they they take in having the best defensive record in the league. Um, and honestly, if I had to pick a favourite, I think it would be Gabriel. Um, I think he's had a much... You know, Saliba had his own things with going alone and stuff, but I think Gabriel's had a tough time in his early couple of years at Arsenal and uh, and he's just kept his head down and now he's flourishing. And I also think it goes massively under the radar how difficult his role in the team is because he has to be the most combatant defender, but he also has to kind of cover for Zinchenko when he's playing and Jorginho. Like that left-hand side is more exposed. Um, and so often he ends up dealing with a winger and and does enough you know whether whatever part of his body it is that he puts on the line for it he does enough so i love them both but if you really had to push me i'd probably go gabriel trevor de vega in the chat says so far i concur with rory in all his views there's such a feel-good factor about arsenal at the moment i absolutely love it uh trevor also follows up by saying i can't wait for the jingle at the end if you're tuning in for the first time you will enjoy that at the end i am sure uh let's move away from the game i mean closing thoughts on the game are that i think we all agree it was a much better more emphatic win than maybe any of us expected even though i was i was confident going into it it's good to rotate the players ahead of uh, Bayern. You know, we made one or two changes. We might expect one or two changes in ahead of Tuesday. It's a good win because Manchester City played just hours before. And, of course, we then followed up with a win. And, of course, Liverpool played at Old Trafford today. So, look, we just got to keep going. And that's the most important thing. I do want to uh, talk about the defence just a little bit. Uh, we've had a phenomenal start to 2024. Uh, this image I used on the quick reaction video on Latte Firm yesterday, so forgive me if you guys have already watched that. But, Ped, let's bring you into the chat. Someone mentioned just a few moments ago about David Raya. He missed the first five, six games of the season, and it looks like he's got the golden glove wrapped up. But yesterday, he uh, secured this feat, which is five consecutive away clean sheets. Now, listen, West Ham away, unpredictable. Burnley and Sheffield United, OK, you'd be forgiven for saying that they were low-level opposition. But City and Brighton, both teams, have caused us many problems over the years. This is phenomenal. Your thoughts on the goalkeeper, Pedro? He's um, he's he's a really interesting guy. He's both exciting and boring at the same time. He's exciting because with the ball at his feet, he's incredible. Like it's it, you know he's like a Jorginho with goalkeeper gloves on. Like he's got such an, a wild range of passing. You know, even he's launched um, even his launched kicks. Uh, uh, accurate you know we've started a lot of counter attacks off the back of him and so that's the exciting part but he's also quite a boring keeper in the sense that he does so he does so many things really well um to the point of boredom that Aaron Ramsdale didn't do 
every time a cross goes into the box, and I think that the key the key challenge that any keeper that comes to the Premier League, you have to be able to deal with that you don't deal with in you know La Liga or Serie A. You have to be able to deal with relentless crosses into the box. And it's a real skill to be able to get under that ball when you know you've got someone like Ivan Tony coming in with sharp elbows to jab you in the ribs. And because he's played with Ivan Tony for so long and played with the Brutes over at Brentford, he's one of the best claimers of crosses that I've ever seen. He never makes a drama out of it. He doesn't roll on the floor. He doesn't get up and wink uh, um, opposition fans. He's just so calm and he will try and catch the ball instead of parrying it. He doesn't marvel at his own saves. He's always well positioned. And, you know, I, I think what we were buying with Raya, apart from the great kicking, was somebody that could make great saves. He was like top four in the Premier League for save percentages where Aaron Ramsdale was 12th. And, you don't get to make a lot of uh, a lot of saves at Arsenal, and uh, that save that he made yesterday was utterly world class, and it was the save that we've been waiting for. Just to be like, is he is he really good? If you know, if we were getting battered, would he would he save us points? And I think that he saved us points yesterday. I think he's been absolutely immense, particularly since he's you know had a, a mid season break going to Dubai, and the the big question that we all had: Did we sign another number two? That was the big concern, and now I don't think so. I think we've got a top three goalkeeper in the Premier League at the moment, and he's having an absolutely immense season. He really is. Uh, 4 3 3 saying Raya's calmness at the back has made such a difference, by the way. Yeah, you can tell, you can see it. It kind of oozes through the defence. Like, he's so calm, so reliable. His passing is just on point. And like Pedro, you say, you know, in moments where you're not having too much to do in, in games, sorry, where you're not having too much to do to, to keep that concentration and to make that save so quickly. Fantastic. Rory, before I come to you on the sequence of results that we've had this year, a couple of quick chats uh, to just to read out. Tamina Ahmed, welcome. Snack check, snake check. Snack check is strawberry jam tart. Uncle Doris with an absolute whopper of a snack check. Up here in Manchester, it's a late lamb daka gusan, sag alu, pilau rice and garlic naan. I'm chuffed and stuffed. Uh, tell me where you got that from, Uncle Doris. Let me know. And uh, Kyle says, FK, have you tried the sack of sauce yet with some lemon and herb? Hashtag Lemon and Herb FC. I've not tried the Saka Sauce yet. I've been fasting all month. Um, as soon as Eid comes and goes, it's got to be time for Saka Sauce. Is the Saka um, Sauce Lemon and Herb? No, it's not. It's not it's even like spicy. A, I, think, I think it's a mild spice sea sauce. Obviously, Little Chili is his nickname. Oh, okay. So it's, it's got to be some sort of chili in it, but not had the pleasure of doing it. And yeah, look, Lemon and Herb FC. Lemon and Herb is the best flavor at Nando's, no doubt. No doubt about it. I'm, not, I'm prepared to go to war on this. Um, <laughs> Rory, the sequence of results that you see on the right-hand side, courtesy of Premier League on Twitter, 10 wins and a draw in our last 11. I mean, if we are to win the league, you're probably expecting us to pick up at least six wins in the next seven. That will be 16 wins from 18. That is phenomenal. And obviously, this, this all comes since the sort of Dubai break that Pedro mentioned. But what what can you put it down to? Is it just the team have clicked? Is it is it that mid season break where? I mean, we're so bloody good at football. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's I it. mean, yeah, that is that is the that is it. We are just really good at football. But um, no, I think it's a culmination of things. I think the defense we had seen in a lot of games early in the season, the defense was really good, but we were conceding silly goals. I think in the first twenty games, we conceded twenty goals. Um, in the following 11 games we've conceded four so tightened up defensively but really I think that was a mindset thing more than anything else um, and then the attack has just clicked I think we've seen you know with Kai Havertz coming through um, that has worked and uh, and yeah so we've started scoring more goals which has been great but I mean it really is the defensive record that's that's mind-boggling like four goals conceded in 11 games that is I mean, I, I think if you do the maths, that's that's better than that Chelsea season where they conceded 15 goals, which is the the record that no one thinks anyone could ever beat. Um, and the longer this run goes, the more it's like, okay, maybe maybe we could have actually done that this season if we hadn't cost ourselves so many times. But it's ridiculous. It is ridiculous. I mean, Pedro, I don't know if you want to add any thoughts on on our sequence of results or why it's happening the way that it is. I mean, we are the underlying metrics will show that we are the the, the best at attacking. The best at defending. The results are phenomenal. I mean, what more is there to say? I think that you also have to remember there there was a big contingent of Arsenal fans that were like, you don't need to change anything. And Arteta spent the front half of the season making a lot of changes to how we played to 
because if you don't change anything, Pep Guardiola will, and then he'll be even further ahead of you. And when you make changes, it takes a while for those changes to bed in. And that's why at the start of the season, some of the criticism was like, it looks very robotic and it doesn't feel very fluid. Well, that's what it was like when Arteta first came in, because you're you're learning all of these new movements, these new triggers, and it takes a while for those moves to bed in. And the second, you know, I don't think it's a coincidence that the, the mid-season break really triggered um, the resurgence. Like December, you could see something was about to bang. And then since since Dubai, it's just been absolutely incredible. And um, everybody's settled in. Like Raya felt connected to the squad. Uh, Kai Havertz really came into his own. And now you think about like what's what's the what's the move next season? How do how do you upgrade this squad? You could go well, into next season not need it. I mean, this is well, uh, well. Let me ask you this question because Josh Stanton asked this earlier on, and I thought this would be the perfect time to ask it. He says at Le Grove and uh, open to you as well, Rory. Sorry to cover you temporarily. He says apart from winning a trophy, what else do you think Arsenal need to do to complete the revolution? Is it buying a top player from a rival, e.g. United? They're not a rival. They're mid table dross, Josh. But no. I mean, the point there is to your to your point, Pedro. Like, what is the next step? What, what do you think? What do you think we're missing, if anything, to take us to the level of just relentless competition and competing for like the best and biggest honors in the game? I think there are some top quality squeaky wheels that we have in the squad at the moment. Zinchenko is a brilliant player, but he lacks availability. Same with Gabby Jesus. I feel like if you had more robust versions of those, that we'd be a better side. And I know Kai Havertz has done a really good job as playing as a centre forward, but if we could sign somebody like Evan Ferguson and break them into the squad over the next two seasons and have that sort of next gen Harry Kane like player, I think that I think that that's what we lack. We don't have a, a 25, 30 goal a season striker, and I, I do think that that is the next evolution of this squad, like finding someone that can be reliable in front of goal consistently. Do you know? You're absolutely right. And Mr. Happy has just put in a little comment saying, I will move Zinni and Jesus on, to be honest. And at some point, Arsenal fans are going to have to get comfortable with the fact that we're going to move some players on. You know, this group of players is such a likeable group of players. You know, one or two sort of stalwarts to go, Cedric Suarez, Moel Nenny, you know, thank you so much for your service. But at some point, there's going to be players that we, we love. You know, Ramsdale, I'm not ready to hate him yet. Yeah, I'm going to see him maybe in a Chelsea shirt or a Newcastle shirt next season. I'm not ready for that, but we're going to have to make some really uncomfortable decisions if we want to go that up that level. Rory, I want to get your thoughts on that. Just a couple of quick things, though, before I do. Uh, Joel says, can we get Late Night Latte on Spotify? You absolutely can, my friend. Get on there and have yourself a real treat. Uh, Kyle says, FK, have you seen the tweet where some girl has said she doesn't understand the Dubai hype? I have indeed. And Arsenal fans have been quoting it all day long with our form since we got back. I have that chuckled me very, it made me chuckle very much. Um, Rory, your thoughts? How do we take this team to the next level if there is such a move or such an addition? Yeah, I think, like you said, I think there's still elements of the bench probably that we can level up. I still don't think if you went pound for pound squad with Man City that we got a as good a squad as them. Um, and then I really think the next thing is just, you know, another season next season. We've got to have another title race next season. We've got to go deep in the Champions League next season. It needs to become normal for this to be what Arsenal do, which I think it will. I think I look at the squad, I don't really see how it could fall apart from this point. I think we built such a good foundation. There's such a young core. Um, but I think that's the next big thing. And then, you know, if we go and win a Champions League, I think that is, that's revolution complete at that point. That's something we've never done before. Could you imagine? And listen, all this without Jury and Timber, drummer yeah. 3354 says we still have Timber to come in. That's going to be a cheat code, adding him to this defence. Phenomenal. Uh, right, let's wrap up by looking at the league table. Uh, so today, Pedro, Liverpool went to Old Trafford and, of course, they stumbled. They drew 2-2 uh, despite going 1-0 up thanks to Luis Diaz's goal. Manchester United came back with a freak Bruno Fernandes goal, which got me right out of my seat. And then when Maynou scored, did the Makeda goal, I absolutely lost it. And I was praying. I was biting all my nails. I was pacing across my living room thinking, come on, United, just hold on. But they couldn't. What do you make of the 2-2, Pedro? Um, yeah, just your thoughts in the sort of, you know, couple of hours post the game. Liverpool have been incredibly lucky all season. Everything has rolled for them. Like, you know, I, I was watching that Liverpool game. I was like, the quality of this game 
really isn't there at all. It's like, it's open. It's all over the place. I feel like this could be 5-5 five, five and no one would argue with it. But you've got the Klopp narrative and everything's falling their way. Um, but finally, they got an unjust two points taken away from them. They absolutely battered Man United. Darwin Nunes will not be sleeping well tonight. Um, but that happens. And I, I think that there was this kind of a bit of a weird narrative brewing where it was like, everyone was like, well, Liverpool are going to win all their games. And so are Manchester City. And it's like, I still think there are going to be some twists and turns. But putting us in the driving seat and seeing these numbers that we're still third favourites, like that that suits me down to the ground. We just have to get past Tottenham. If we if we win all our games and beat Tottenham, we win the Premier League. That Tottenham game is the one that's really hanging over us. They've been gifted by the Premier League fixture gods a 15-day break. Um, I think it's after the Newcastle game before us. So they basically get a Dubai break to prepare to play Arsenal, which is so unjust. Um, and the crazy thing is, by the time they play Manchester City and Liverpool, they might have already qualified for the Champions League. And what do you think that... What do you think they're going to do yeah. then? They're going to take their foot well, off the gas. So we really, it's that the next six games, I believe, we have to be so focused because if we can get past Tottenham, then then we're winning the league. But that, uh, that that's the game that's on my mind right now. Just on that break, though, Pedro, I mean, we've got some nice fixtures. I know we've got three games, uh, sorry, a game every three days for the next sort of two weeks until we get towards the end of the month. But would you rather the 15 days off? Would you rather that break? Or would you rather just keep going and keep building momentum? And this, this team is on such off. a phenomenal run. 15 you? days off, definitely. Um, but he, here's the, here's it's the interesting time, thing. a long time though, Ped. It, I mean, you, you start maybe losing that sharpness. You might not be match three, fit. Three, Two weeks three is a long weeks time. Is, three weeks is too long. Two weeks is kind of perfect getting back to fitness. Players get to have a little holiday. You can coach the shit out of them. Oh, sorry for cursing. Here's the interesting game that uh, I've been thinking about, and I wanted to run this by you. So uh, there are there's a coefficient league table, and England sit third. The top two teams in the coefficient table, they get a fifth Champions League place. So Aston Villa uh, have the chance to go into the semi-finals of the Europa League. If Aston Villa get into the semi-finals, there's a good chance that that secures them the fifth spot. So this Aston Villa game that we're all worried about, Unai Emery, what do you think he's going to do? Like, we know that he loves the Europa League. If he can throw it all at the Europa League, he can, in a weird twist of fate, secure himself Champions League football by getting that extra place. And Spurs fans, if we, they, they might be cheering Arsenal versus Bayern Munich because if we beat Bayern Munich, that takes the German clubs out of the equation and secures their place in the Champions League. Do you think I'm going a little bit too deep there? No, I don't. No, you're not. But yeah, I mean, it's head spinning stuff. Like, you've got to take a moment to think about it. I think as much as all of that is, and to your point about Spurs going easy once they've got Champions League football lined up, I just think you, we just got to take a game at a time, focus on what's ahead of us. I've been, I've been asked the question, Ped, like, do you want to just go out to Bayern Munich this week if it meant that? And of course not. Of course not. Arsenal are back in the big time for, for the first time in so long. Like, who gives a fuck about what it means for other positions and other spots? We are good enough to go to Spurs and get that win. We are good enough to lay it down to Bayern Munich this week and, and you know, in the second leg and go through. And, and hopefully it's a semi against Real Madrid. And let's get Arsenal back to Wembley. What a what a run that would be. And, and listen, if you're going to win the league, you gotta you got to put together phenomenal runs. You know, gone are the days of 75, 85 point champions. Manchester City have set this benchmark for a number of years now. Liverpool have got so close. As much as I mock Klopp, They've gotten so close over the years and they've not won league titles despite getting 90 plus points. Them's the standards. And that's what we've got to raise the game to. So for me, it's just win everything that we can. Don't worry about Champions League spots being extended. Don't worry about fixture congestion. Don't worry about not having 15 days off and whatnot. We are good. We are good. We can take all of these teams. Um, and there's just a couple of comments in the chat. I know, Ped, you've got to go as well. So if you if you feel like dropping off, please feel free to do so. Uh, FPL Nima says, usually listen on Twitter, but first time watching on YouTube. Been a great show. There are just shy of 2,000 of you watching live right now across both platforms. More than 500 on YouTube, which is amazing. If we can get 500 likes on YouTube, that would be a phenomenal achievement for the channel and would be uh, much appreciated. V Vlad says, I agree with Pedro. If we're top after Spurs, we win the title. Um, oh, Haroon. Uh, also in the house says, I don't think the break benefits them. Teams want to be tuned up and match ready at this stage. And that's exactly my point. Rory, what are your thoughts? Um, I mean, look, the, the, the optra analyst uh, predictor 
has had some movement and it shows on the right hand side that Manchester City are still favourites for the title. Uh, but Liverpool's percentage chances, probability has has dropped massively and ours has increased. What do you make of all the predictors type stuff and what, what are your thoughts on the title race? Yeah, I don't really care about the predictor, but I do actually quite like the fact that we're still the third favourite. So I think that's uh, the longer we're not sat at the top every week and the, the, there's a different type of pressure when you're leading the race. So I don't mind that at all. Um, in terms of the table, I, I think this justifies going to the Etihad and getting a point if it needed further justification. Um, because, you know, if we'd lost that game to City, City would be top at this point. And uh, as much as it, you know, we could have gambled and gone for the win, as it is, a week later, it's in our hands. Um, and, you know, Arteta arguably gambled on the fact, and it was probably a more sensible gamble, that Liverpool would drop points. And, you know, it has looked for a while that Liverpool weren't sustainable. And and I did feel like we kept saying, oh, this can't be sustainable, it can't be sustainable, but you're 30 games in and you're still there, so maybe it is. But, you know, games like today, I don't think that's the last time we'll see Liverpool drop points. And honestly, I wouldn't be massively surprised if it ended up being Arsenal versus City and that, Liverpool did tail off a bit. So it's, yeah, it's going to be very stressful. The Tottenham game, I think you're right. I think uh, having that big break, I don't know if it's the best thing. I think I look at the the opening half an hour of that game. You know, City. a lot of City players have said before that they get to this point in the season where it's a game every three days and you almost just kind of hit flow state where it's you don't have time to think about the next game. You just go and play the same way again and again. So, yeah, I think that game's the big one, obviously. And um, hopefully we just smash three past them in the first half an hour and job done yeah let's hope so let's hope so right we're gonna stop the slide deck there we will look at the lead table in just a second uh but before we before we let you go pedro if anybody wants to follow pedro he's available at le grove if you're asleep and not tuning into his podcast and reading his writing um ped tuesday bayern munich massive game gargantuan game good to be back at europe's top table what are you doing with the team for that game you making any changes if you're the gaffer I'm wondering whether whether you can play Jorginho in a game like that after you've just played him quite a lot. I wonder whether he rolls the dice on Thomas Partey starting in that game. I'm hoping that Saka can shake off whatever problem he picked up. And then I, I, I'm, I'm, you're going full strength. I want to see Martinelli back out there on the left. And then um, Tommy, Tommy Asu uh, at left back. And then let's see what we've got. Like this is this is a really interesting game as well because it's like if you lose to Bayern Munich, there's no shame, but if you beat them, it feels big. You know, I know it's not the best Bayern side. I know that they've you know not won their first league title in 11, 12 seasons, but it's it's a big game. And um, I, I think if if we it, uh, some crazy number like eighteen of the last twenty teams that have led in the first leg go on to win the game. So if you if we can get a win at home against a team that just got beaten uh, by a team I'd not even heard of until last week. That's massive. So it'd be it'd be really interesting. We, we, like Under Arsene Wenger, in the peak years, we'd normally go out in the quarterfinals. So anything is bonus from here on in. But I really would like to get to the semifinals and just hope that it's not Manchester City. Yeah, a Manchester City tie would just... It'd be too, too much, much for me to take. I mean, Rory, you got any thoughts on the Bayern game? And you'd have to fancy Real Madrid, surely. Yeah, I mean, the Bayern game, I think you're right, pretty much agree with that lineup. I think we'd all, you know, really, I think the only decision is Partey or Jorginho. I think because we've not seen that Rice Partey Erdegaard midfield really at all this season, is it a bit of a gamble? I don't know because he's, you know, Partey is such an elite player. But I do think we've got to be aggressive. I think we've got to go for it in the home leg. And then we've seen, we, you know, if we, if we are leading after the first leg, I'd absolutely back us to win the tie because. I think we can go to the Etihad, uh, not the Etihad, the Alliance, and get a nil-nil draw. We saw it with the Etihad. I think we can go and, and close up shop. So, yeah, get a big win on Tuesday night. Um, I'm buzzing, actually. I just managed to secure a ticket, finally, after uh, hours of work. So, I'm going to be there. And then, yeah, hopefully Real Madrid. Look, without Kyle Walker, Man City looked really exposed on the break. And I'm looking at Vinicius Jr. just tearing them apart in that game. So, hopefully... I mean, God, it would be good to have an Arsenal Real Madrid semi final. Rory, do you think if Madrid beat Man City, do you think that that rattles them in the league? Do you think that this is this is all they really care about? Yeah, well, it could go one of two ways. It could rattle them in the league, or it could be like, well, if we don't win the league here, then this is a this is probably our worst season under Pep, pretty much. So, 
could go yeah it could go one or two ways but i think it could go the i could think it could go that way that it does rattle them a little bit because they realize hang on we might not be the best team in the league and we're not the best team in europe anymore and there's quite a few players looking to move on aging out it, it could be a big uh it could be a big thing for them but we'll see Bakary Lasagna. I love the username, by the way. Imagine Spurs versus City becomes a decider and Spurs have to take points off City to keep top four, but doing so hands us the title. These these mind mind fucks are just too much for me to get through. There's lots of people in the chat talking about Real Madrid in the semi-final. That would be wonderful. Look, it's a massive game against Bayern Munich. They haven't had quite the season that they're so used to. Bayer Leverkusen, Granit Xhaka's Bayer Leverkusen, absolutely flying at the moment, unbeaten in 40 games. One game away from the Bundesliga title. Fair fucks to Granit Xhaka, right? Uh, but it's Bayern Munich who come to London on Tuesday. We will be back with a post-match phone-in on Tuesday night and a quick reaction video. Then, of course, we'll have a late-night latte deep dive maybe on Wednesday evening for that game. Uh, let's do the league table. Uh, Pedro, you're free to drop off if you want, but there are 2,000 people watching. Uh, do follow Thanks Pedro. Thanks for having me. Nice to meet you, Rory. Pleasure to have you, my friend, as always. Rory, if you want to stick around, because I'm going to ask you for your title prediction. Right. First up... <laughs> I love this. Trevor De Vega has been waiting for this moment for so long. Okay. Hopefully, you guys can hear me now. Uh, the Premier League table is on screen. Arsenal are top of the league. Look at that. Take it all in. 31 games played. 75 goals scored. 24 goals conceded. A goal difference of plus 51. And we are on 71 points. Liverpool are not joined top. They are second, Jamie Carragher. They are second. They are level on points, but they have an inferior goal difference, plus 42. Manchester City, who beat Crystal Palace yesterday at Selhurst in the early kickoff, are in third, just a point behind. Arsenal play Aston Villa at home next. Liverpool play Crystal Palace at home next. And Manchester City play Luton Town at home next. That is uh, the next weekend of fixtures. Spurs, after beating Nottingham Forest tonight, climb into fourth place. Unai Emery's Aston Villa, who come to the Emirates, are now in fifth place. They are both level on points, Spurs having the superior goal difference. Uh, Manchester United, after their point against Liverpool, have climbed into sixth, and they are the best of the rest. West Ham seventh, Newcastle eighth. Chelsea drawing 2-2 to Sheffield United today, a late equaliser for them. Uh, denying them of the three points. As we scroll down to the bottom, Sheffield United firmly rooted to the bottom of the table. I think it's farewell for Chris Wilder and his men, Burnley in 19th. Rob Edwards, we are all behind you, my friend. Luton Town, if we can get you up, that would be phenomenal. Uh, Nottingham Forest, Brentford and Everton. Everton, that is going to be a key fixture. Everton in 15th, four points above the relegation zone at the moment, but they host a Merseyside derby against our title rivals, Liverpool, in just a couple of weeks' time. Potentially... The last Merseyside derby at Goodison Park. Definitely the last Merseyside derby for Jurgen Klopp. Rory, the final question. Take us out on tonight's show in front of 1,975 people. Where is the league title going? Uh, it's going to North London. It's got to. The way we played it, this is the first time I've said it, but the way we played this weekend, we are a better team than Man City, than Liverpool. We're not as vulnerable we're better in attack. It's coming. It's coming. It's coming. I love it. Just look at the lead table. Can I ask you a slightly different question? Sorry, I know I said that was the last question, but do you see all three teams winning all of their remaining games? No. I think we'll all drop points. Same. Still, still Same. Win. So there's a lot of talk in, like, in the, you know, I'm sure you've got WhatsApp chat groups and, and Twitter sort of group message, messaging, but there's a lot of talk about, you know, we win seven out of seven. I don't think we're going to win all seven. But I also think that Liverpool and City are both going to drop points. It, it is, as Sir Alex used to say, squeaky bum time. Um, yes. But yeah, seven out of seven, I just don't think it's going to happen. There might be a lot of people that are watching who disagree with that. Uh, by the way, lots of love coming in for, yep, the music, <laughs> the jingle, the glorious. Trevor De Vega's happy. Finally, yes, yes, yes. I know there's some audio muffling with my microphone at the start of the tune. I don't know what it is. I think it's a, I think it's a, a StreamYard thing. Uh, just one thing. V Vlad says, I'm hearing Xhaka for the Ballon d'Or. I certainly wouldn't disagree with that. Um, although I'd like to see an Arsenal player win it, to be fair. Right. We are going to end it there. It's been a great show. And listen, it's been a privilege to prepare, pre prepare and to present and to, to host these shows for you throughout the season. Uh, it's really good fun, especially when Arsenal are winning. The community is fantastic. We just reached 22,000 subscribers on the channel, which I'm immensely grateful for. 
There are almost 2,000 of you watching live right now on this Sunday evening just before Match of the Day, which I'm also immensely grateful for. If I could kindly ask you to please leave a like on the video. It's a massive help to the channel. It helps raise the profile. Get involved with Rory as well. Great channel. I uh, love your, your thumbnails as well, Rory, man. You're doing bits. I saw that wild stream in the middle of the week. Um, but you. Rory is also on X at Rory underscore talks underscore football. Um, we will be back with a post-match phone-in on Tuesday night. And then we'll do the quick reaction video. You can see the quick reaction video for the Brighton game on the YouTube channel feed now. And um, then we'll have the late night latte. The games are coming thick and fast, but the games are also beginning to run out. Seven more left in the Premier League as Arsenal are top. Four games away from Wembley in the Champions League. Dare we dream. Look after yourselves. Have a great week. Bye for now.